Let me join with uh, Patrick's word as we begin our service this morning and welcoming all of you who are with us this morning. We have a number of guests with us as well. It is a holiday weekend and uh, we anticipated that, but as a result, we have a number of our own who are away and out of town, and so we wish them Godspeed and pray that they will be safe as they travel back to us. Um, we also want to always appreciate those who are watching online, and we do have a number who do that, and I'm appreciative of that, and uh, at least of the ones that I know who do that, they are unable to be in a service with Christians, and so uh, I am grateful that they take an opportunity to watch what we do each Lord's Day and seek to engage in that with us each Lord's Day, and that's beneficial to us. I am uh, grateful today that we have an opportunity to come together and study from God's Word. I, I, never, I never take uh, these opportunities for granted. I hope that you don't. I think these are important times for us as Christians and as those who are seeking to serve God and honor God with our lives. And I know, I know you do that, but I just want to remind us of that because we should never take these opportunities for granted. And I know that we don't, and I know we appreciate those. It's been a while since you've seen this particular screen. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I told you that I wanted to talk about some things this year periodically that had to do with this idea of knowing God, and I want to pick that back up. I've kind of taken the time off this summer to do some other things in the lessons, but I want to pick this back up and continue it uh, fairly regularly through the course of the, the next several months as we finish out the year, God willing. We reverence God. I think we do that because there is a degree to which we understand God based upon what the Bible says. But the idea of God fascinates most everybody. You mention the subject of God to people, anyone, and they'll have a comment about it. We're fascinated by God in part because we don't understand everything about Him. That's part of the decision that I have made to try to talk to you over the course of the year about some things that relate to God. But there's so much that we don't know. Let me give you a little friendly advice. If you're ever in a social environment, whether it's Christian or non-Christian, and the conversations get slow, mention God. That'll pick it up pretty quick. Whether the persons that you're with agree with you or whether they don't, just the mention, for the most part, will cause everyone to have an idea and engage someone to say something about that. I want to talk to you this morning about really one aspect of these three aspects. There are three facts about God that are assumed in Scripture. They may not always be stated. Usually they aren't, but they're always understood in every verse. First of all is the fact that God is, that He is uh, always and He's always been. He's eternal. And I will confess to you that that whole concept just for lack of a better term, kind of blows my mind. I believe it because it's what he says. But it's hard for us in our minds to comprehend, I think, the fact that he is eternal. But he is. The second fact is that he acts. That he is the absolute monarch of the universe and he orders all its affairs, and whatever he orders happens. I'll tell you what, whatever happens in our world, God orders or allows because he is God. You just let that sink in for just a second. He's not somebody else like us. He's not somebody who's just simply above us, but like us. He's not that. He's God. And he acts. And he acts in exactly the way he wants to act. Because he's God. And he speaks. He speaks. He utters words that express his will. And then once he utters the word, what's interesting about that is then it's done. 
Whatever God says happens. Whenever he says it's going to happen, that's when it happens. He speaks. And the Bible clearly states that. Now, I want us to focus this morning on this fact. He speaks. In the Tuesday's men class that Doug host, that Doug and Beth host at their home, we have just finished studying the prophet Joel, the Old Testament prophet Joel. I, I, just as a side, I want to say this. If you're a man and you can take advantage of those Tuesday classes, let me encourage you to do so. They're good. It's not only is it good to be together as men, but it's, it's good to talk about God's word as men. And so let me encourage you, if you don't, that if you can, come to those classes at Doug and Beth's house on every other Tuesday at this point. But as we studied the book of Joel, we, we were studying chapter 3, the final chapter of the book of Joel, and, and someone read it, and as they read it, I was reading in my own text. And I ran across, and we ran across these two verses. And I'm going to share them with you today, and we'll talk about them. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then Jerusalem shall be holy and no aliens shall ever pass through her again. When God roars, this audience is familiar with lions. I don't know of a church that'd be closer I mean really close to a lion in this church. When we assemble, we're less than a half mile from Leo in his habitat. And on rare occasions when I'm outside during the week, if it's fairly quiet, there occasionally I can hear Leo roar from here. It may not be quite as awesome if, as if I'm down at the habitat itself, but occasionally I can hear him. We understand what it means for a lion to be the king of the jungle. The imagery of a lion is fierce. The imagery of a lion is strong. The imagery of a lion is authoritative. When he speaks, everybody takes notice, whether we're in the jungle or not. Because he is a lion. I want to look closer at Joel 3 later. But before I do that, I want to go to the very beginning. I want us to look at something that I think sometimes, I don't know if it's overlooked. But I think it's something that we need to be reminded of. You know, part of the purpose of Genesis 1 is to show Israel who had been in bondage. And I think this is very important. The reason Moses wrote, it seems to me even primarily that what he wrote in those first five letters is to remind the children of it, not remind, but to tell the children of Israel, this is what you were, this is what you need to understand about what you might have been taught in Egypt. What you were taught there is not true. Here's what is true. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They needed to understand that. In, other, in essence, they needed to understand that he is and that he acts and that he speaks. And so in this circumstance in Genesis 1, God is. In the beginning, God. He created, he acted the heavens and the earth. And then the text says how he did that. And here's how he did it. He spoke. I want you to think about that. He spoke. The text tells us that's what he did. 
He said, let there be. And the text on several occasions says, and it was so. God's creative word, let there be. The first, let there be light. What did it say? And there was light. Let there be light and there was light. Let there be multiple things. Those things were spoken and step by step things sprang into existence. Day and night, sky and land, green vegetation, heavenly bodies, fish and fowl, insects and animals, and man himself came into being because God spoke. I want you clearly, obviously, to understand what I'm saying. God spoke, and all was done by the word of God. Listen carefully to these passages. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You hear that? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The word of God. The word. For this they willfully forget, 2 Peter 3, 5 says, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and they are standing out of water and in the water. Just by the word of God. How many things get made because you say something about it? Zip. Can't do it. God spoke it. God spoke it. He said, let there, let, let, think about it. Let there be light. There's light. Let the firmament and the land separate, and that's what happened. He just said it. I know I've said it now multiple times, but I want us to get it. He said that, and it happened. God not only created by his word, he also insists that all circumstances and events in the world are determined continually by his word. Listen to what, how, how scripture decides this. When, when Kenneth uh, texted me last night and I gave him the reading that he just read for us, he came in this morning and said, you really want me to read from Psalm? He didn't say you really, but he said, it's Psalm 147, isn't it? And I said, yeah. And I could tell that he asked me that because he was impressed with those words. I was too when I read it. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out his hell like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. Have you ever read anything like that? His word runs swiftly. He sends out his command. And there it goes. And it's done. It's what it says. Psalm 148, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? All that happens. Why? It's fulfilling his word. Not this. This. Fulfilling his word. He speaks. He commands it. And it happens. It's documented in this. But he's not talking about this. He's talking about this. That's the God we serve. He not only deals with weather, folks. He deals with what happens in the rise and fall of nations. When God told Jeremiah that he was going to be a prophet, he said to him in Jeremiah 1.10, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Can you imagine Jeremiah hearing, say that again, Lord. 
You, you're telling who? You're telling me? You, you, you're giving me that? That's what he said. I have set this day, I've set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, pull down, destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. How in the world? <laughs> How in the world could that be? He said, I've set you. He said, the other translations say, I have appointed you over the nations. And Jeremiah's going, think, can you imagine Jeremiah thinking, wait just a minute, I'm just a prophet. I'm not a statesman. I'm not a potentate. I'm not you. I'm not related to you. I'm not like you. And yet you're telling me what I'm going to do? And he says, yes. How could a man that has no official position at all, other than the fact that God said, I want you to say it. How could Jeremiah understand that? There's one simple answer. Jeremiah 1 and verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I am telling you that what you say is going to be my words and whatever you say, that's exactly what's going to happen. Any word spoken by Jeremiah would and did come to pass. And to fix this, in Jeremiah's mind, the next verse says to us and shows us what God did. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. God said to Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the branch of an almond tree. It's blooming. What does that tell you? The Lord says, what that tells you it is spring is about here and my word is about to be fulfilled. And we don't have a record of Jeremiah saying it, but my guess, he's, he, he thought about that vision and said, I'm with you, Lord, let's go. Send him a vision. He said, when you say it and it's time to say it, it's going to happen. God through, through Isaiah said the same thing in Isaiah 55. He says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, they don't come down and go back up. They water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You see what Isaiah is being told? When my word goes out, God said to Isaiah, it's going to happen. When my word goes out, it's going to happen. The whole Bible maintains this insistence that God's word is his executive order, its executive instrument in everything that's human. He uses his word to execute his will. He says it and it happens. What God says goes. And may I say to you about that, that we need to be completely impressed with what's on that screen right there. What God says goes. If you're here this morning, and you're not sure about that, may I encourage you to in the next few seconds get very confident. What God says goes. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, what God says goes. It's always been that way. It'll always be that way. And there's two reactions to this. There's two reactions that man has. The first reaction is similar to what's found in Jeremiah 13. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them. He's saying some people just simply refuse to listen. Are you that person? Are you that person? Are you in this audience this morning and you have you just said, I'm not going to listen to what the Bible says. I'm not interested in what God says. This is you. I'm talking to you. That's, that's what he's saying about you. You simply 
refuse to hear my words. You're, you're not at a good place. <laughs> you're not at a good place. Where you need to be is here. Isaiah 66, For all those things my hand has made and all these things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. This is where you need to be. You and I need to be people who tremble at God's word. We tremble at it. My, percep my observation, my perception is this, that, that there aren't many people who tremble at the Word of God anymore. I know my voice just trailed off, but you know exactly what I said. There aren't many people who tremble at the Word of God anymore. But if what God says goes, and He says some refuse to listen, but that you need to be a person who trembles at my word, then we've got two options, folks. We've got only two options. Proudful willfulness or humbleness that says, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Let me make two observations about God's word this morning. The kind of sides to what I'm really talking about, but I think it's important that I mention these two things. First of all, his commands are true. Psalm 119, 151, you're near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. All your commandments are truth. Why are they described like that? Why are God's commandments described like that? I want you to think about something. God's commandments are described as truth. His commandments are true because His commandments are true. True. How about that? They, they, provide, they provide stability and they provide permanence as telling man what God wants to see in every human life of all time, in every age, in every generation. What he said is what's best for you today, just like it was with Adam and Eve. Just like it was in the first century when, when, he, when the Lord himself was on the earth. And just like it is in the 21st century when we read passages in Ephesians 4 that say, don't lie, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth. Why are those commands good and right and profitable and beneficial? Because that's the way people ought to act all the time in every generation. His commands are true. And when we read them, we need to do them. Because they're true. I'll tell you something else they are. His commands are, His promises are true. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. God always keeps his promise. There's not a person on this earth who can say that about themselves. I want you to think about that. There's not a person alive who can say, I keep all my promises. I don't think the intent's wrong. Sometimes we just forget. We just forget things that we promise we'll do or things that we have avowed that we'll do. We just, we just simply can forget those things. I'm not saying that it's intentional, but that's just the way we are. Not God. Listen, my friend, that's why, that, that, that's, that's part of the great benefit of being a Christian, right? As we sit here this morning, we are alive in this world but yet, as we think about those who have gone before, who have been a part of our families and our church family and our lives, even those who have died most recently, we keep going because God's faithful. Wayne keeps going because God is faithful. Ken Bishop keeps going because God is faithful. Betty Parrish keeps going because God is faithful. How do we know that? 
Because God keeps his promises. And if God keeps his promises, then those who are faithful, those who are his, will be with him forever. That's a promise. And God cannot lie. Psalm 119.90 says, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. What he said, the promise that he made to Adam and Eve, he makes to us. And it's, it's all the same. He's going to do what he says. Folks, listen carefully. His, his commands are true. His promises are faithful. Stay the course. What God says goes. Now, I want to briefly go back and notice something about the original, the original title about when God roars. I want you to go back to a passage in Genesis 49. I want to briefly go back and notice something that were Jacob's last words to Judah. Genesis 49 records the words of Jacob to his sons as before he passes, okay? Listen to what he said to Judah. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. There's a lot in there. There's really a lot to unpack in that section of scripture. I'm not going to unpack it all. For our point this morning, I just want to notice primarily one thing. Judah is a lion's whelp. That simply means he's a young animal. He's a younger version. It is the lion that would come from the tribe of Judah that is going to be the Lion, not a lion, the lion. And Jacob wanted Judah to know that. I don't know if Judah understood that. But if you were to calculate what is being said in Genesis 49, what you would see is there's a lot of messianic ideas presented in that passage. And like a lot of things in the Old Testament, I, I'm confident the prophets didn't understand it. Peter says they didn't understand it. They stated it. And it was true because God was speaking through them just like we've already noticed. But they didn't understand it always. I'm confident Judah didn't understand this. But the people of God began to understand it through the centuries. Because in Revelation 5... The text says, but one of the elders said to me, referring to John, one of the elders said to John, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. I want you to look at this first. But one of the elders said to me, John said, what elder? You ever thought about that? What elder? Who's he talking about? Who was talking to John? You, may, you remember John, John is, is, is what, what we might call, he, John's in a trance. He's seeing these visions. God is allowing him to see these visions. And he's being told. And an elder, it seems, is talking to him. In this heavenly vision. What elder? Earlier in the book of Revelation, the text talks about 24 thrones. Around the throne of God. And, uh, and sitting on those 24 thrones are what? 24 elders. 
What do you think that represents? Well, 24 divided by 2, I'm going to impress you with my math skills, is 12. And it seems to me that what this elder is saying is about those 24 elders is that I want to tell you about why the lion of the tribe of Judah can open and is qualified to open all of these seals that are going to tell you what is going to happen. I think the 24 represent, this is me, I think the 24 represent, first of all, the 12 tribes, which symbolize really what the Old Testament is about. And I think the other 12 represent those apostles. In large measure, at least how the New Testament is presented. Right? So you've got one of the 24 who's saying, let me tell you about why Jesus can, can tell us about the old and the new because he's who he is. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah and he qualifies to talk to us and to open these scrolls so we know nobody else can. That's what the elder says until now. This same, this same lion roared from Jerusalem. You remember? Joel 3. When this lion roared from Jerusalem, it's not hard for us to figure that out. Because those gospels all point toward a time when the word of God would go forth from Jerusalem. Acts 2. And the reason that I think men like Joel, and if you look, if you look in Amos 1, I think it's about verse 2 and 3, the very same words are stated. Amos himself said it. There's two prophets right there, right there on the same pages. The lion roared from Jerusalem. And so, I'm going to tell you that having, having read what I have read in Joel and Amos and having viewed it as I have tried to share with you this morning, it gives me a totally different outlook on Acts 2. When Peter and those other apostles preached that message, you know what was happening? God was roaring. You see that? God was roaring. When others stand before people today and they share the message of the apostles, what is happening? God is roaring. How important is it for us to hear when God roars? It's because whatever he says goes. Whatever he says, folks, goes. And that's why I think this lesson is important. It's because when those apostles were preaching the word of God in Acts 2. They were trying to convince those Christians, or rather those people who were sinners, that they needed to obey the gospel, that they needed to repent, that they needed to be baptized for their mission of their sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were, that he was, they, they were speaking so that God's word, in essence, was going forth from Jerusalem.
You see how important this message of what the elder said about the line of the tribe of Judah is? It's because that same line from the tribe of Judah roared from Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Through the apostles preaching and it continues to roar today. You hearing it? Listen. Don't you listen carefully? You hearing, you hearing God roar today? Not physically. You, there, there's not going to be some audible cry. You're going to hear God roar. But God is roaring every minute of every day saying, listen to my word. If today... You have had a deaf ear. If today, at this point in time in your life, you're not hearing it, I'm going to say it to you this way. You better hear it. You better hear it. Because it's not going to come back to him void. What he says is going to come to pass 100%. You and I have been given the option. Will we hear the roaring of the lion from Jerusalem? May God help us to do that. If we can assist you, if we can help you somehow to make your life the kind of life that he wants, then we want to do that. I say it all the time, and I'll say it again. I can't make you. Nobody else can make you. He simply asks you to consider what he says. And if your heart is pliable and such that you would, he will gladly welcome you into his kingdom. Could we help you this morning do that? While we stand, while we sing.